Okay, we're ready to go. Thank you, Esther. Thank you. Uh, well, I want to first welcome everyone to this uh, webinar and uh, I want to really thank you a lot for participating and being here today and taking part uh, in, in this webinar. And of course, uh, I will start with introducing uh, the, the team of uh, people that started uh, with the idea and uh, the development of this webinar. Um, behind this uh, this idea are um, well three uh, women. Uh, first, uh, Brittany from uh, Refugium, and I would like Brittany to maybe tell a little bit about uh, Refugium and about herself. Thank you, Estelle, and thank you everybody for for coming here and being with us today. We're really grateful that you're here. Um, so yeah, I'm the founder of an NGO called Refugium. Um, which is a gym that is run for refugees by refugees in Malakasa camp, which is just north of Athens. Um, we've been running in Malakasa since November 2018. Um, and like I already mentioned, it's a model that means that um, I wanted to move away from the uh, typical NGO model of a high reliance on international volunteers and instead have it run by the refugee community themselves. So seeking out people in within the camp who are skilled or feel passionately about sports so they could lead the classes by themselves. Um, so for example, right now we have five teachers from the refugee community, but over the past year, specifically, we've had um, 15, and that means that we've had like a super broad timetable. So we've taught everything from um, aerobics to Zumba, um, swimming, Taekwondo, martial arts, Kung Fu, volleyball, football, all of these different activities um, on the premise that sports helps um, your mental health, right? And so our, our motto is exercise endorphins. So the feel good hormone that you get when you exercise and escapism as well so even if it's temporary escapism from you know thinking about your situation and thinking about your problems you're less concerned with them you know when you're in the midst of a football match or when you're dancing away to zumba um so that's both in the camp and then we also run exercises outside of the camp as well so we've done things like hiking activities in the nearby malakasa mountains swimming even stand up paddle boarding and windsurfing lessons um, so yeah, that's what we do and uh, really proud that it's predominantly run by the refugee community with me supporting them in the background. Thank you. Thank you a lot thank Chris, you. for the introduction and thank you for, uh, for being here and for all the super work you do. Uh, and I would like to introduce uh, the other woman who had uh, this idea and who uh, really uh, is behind all the logistics today. It's uh, Iman from uh, Habibi Works. And uh, if Iman, you want to uh, introduce a little bit the work you started in uh, Ioannina? Yeah. yeah. So hello everyone, my name is Iman. And um, for the main part, I'm the women's sports coordinator at Habibi Works. Uh, Habibi Works, it's an intercultural makerspace in the north of Yanina. I think maybe a few of you have heard of it. And basically, it's um, a space that has about 11 different workshop areas, and it's right ac uh, across Katsika Camp, which has about 1,400 residents. And both the residents of the camp and local people have access to the workshops to make the things they need. And at a very basic level, it gives people the agency to find the solutions to their own issues, even if it's putting curtains in their own caravan or making their own shoe shelves uh, and whatnot. And one of the workshop areas in Habibi Works is Habibi Gym. So under Habibi Gym, we have a women's sports um, program to make the gym more accessible to women um, because the gym sometimes can be predominantly male. So it's just to balance out uh, the women feeling comfortable taking space in gym and sports. And similar to Brit's program, I think, or Refuge Gym, it's the similar sentiment of sports as a way of empowerment, which today the panelists will go into more detail about. Thank you very much, Iman, for the introduction. And I will also introduce a little bit about Yoga and Sport for Refugees. Uh, we are working in Lesbos uh, in Greece, and uh, we are uh, doing 
uh, sport activities with, as uh, Brittany said, also with community teachers, uh, which means that almost all of our classes are also run by the community here, living in different uh, camps or in different uh, facilities in uh, in Mytilene and in well in in Lesbos itself, and we have uh, sports um, from martial arts or different kind of martial arts, uh, running as well. We have uh, swimming in the summer, uh, volleyball, basketball, uh, football, uh, uh, running yoga, and yeah, all kind of different sports that we propose and which are taught by, uh, um, by the community here. And uh, as uh, Brittany already mentioned, it's a, a great way of escapism and of feeling better and of creating something which is very important for uh, support and uh, especially um, mental health and well-being support. Um, so that's a little bit about the introduction about yoga and sports. And now I will quickly explain a little bit the flow of the webinar of today. Uh, what we are going to do, I'm going to introduce a little bit the panelists of today. Uh, then we will start with a small icebreaker with a few questions where you can uh, freely answer and where we can uh, develop a little bit. Uh, then the panelists will share about their experience and their challenges uh, uh, during their work within uh, the different organization. And of course, if you have any question during the webinar, uh, would you be so kind to put them in the chat and then we can, uh, Iman will select a few questions for uh, our different pa panelists today and then they will be asked at the end of uh, each uh, uh, panelist um, presentation. So then you can uh, please keep your vi video and uh, your uh, microphone muted. Uh, that would be really great. And then we can uh, go on and uh, start uh, directly. So I can present uh, quickly our panelists and have a small introduction. Um, first, we will have Elske and Kiki, uh, who are going to talk about the power of sports as universal language and about uh, the running uh, group they created. Uh, I don't know if you want to quickly say hi, Elske and Kiki. Sure. Um, I'm Elske. I have been uh, working in Habib Works in the north of Greece for three years almost, and now I'm back in the Netherlands. And at the time I was there, uh, me and Kiki together, we started this, this running group, which we will tell more about later. Thank you very much. And I want to introduce uh, also the panelists from yoga and sport, which will be Suhela and uh, Mona. Uh, Suhela will talk about karate athletes and facilitating, facilitating sports. And I will ask her to introduce quickly herself. Hello everyone, I'm Suhela, one of the teachers at yoga and sport for refugees. And uh, I'm teaching karate there and it's more than seven months that we arrived here at Lesbos. And, uh, Okay. Yeah. And I will also present, introduce uh, Mona. I think she's uh, connected, but she's uh, in another location. Um, and she will talk a little bit about uh, the journey from being a student to being a teacher in the in yoga and sports and through her teaching of uh, yoga. Uh, Mona, can you hear us and can you introduce us yourself, please? Yeah, I think her mic is not working. Yeah, so maybe yeah, maybe for now you can send a message in the chat. And maybe quick, Kiki, if you just want to quickly jump in. We kind of missed you earlier. Yeah, Yeah. sorry. Um, no problem. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I um, was also with Habibi Works from the beginning 2017 until uh, mid 2019. 
and uh, then I left and I'm currently uh, working in Germany and um, as Iman and Elske have already said, uh, Habibi Works uh, functions as a platform for encounter and uh, empowerment and education and um, Elske and I will talk a little bit about the running group that we set up with which we also participated in a variety of different events uh, over a time span of about a year, a year and a half. Yeah, so nice to meet everybody virtually. Thank you a lot, Kiki, and thank you for meeting you again. Uh, I will go on and start with the small icebreaker. I will share my screen so you can all see what are the questions. And if you, I will post also, I think it's already in the group, um, but you can, yeah, thank you, Iman. So you can directly go on uh, menti.com and use the code and join uh, to reply to the different questions that we will see right now. I will share with you now my screen. Ah, oh, well, you can see the, the question directly. So you don't need, I think. Okay, I see that as we talk, a lot of people are answering in the in the menti.com. So I will start with the first question already um, to ask you, so why do you think people, uh, why do we offer sport? Why different organizations offer sport when people uh, most of the time don't have access to basic needs like uh, water, uh, correct food and uh, accommodation and a lot of you uh, choose the different um, answers that were possible and it's very true that the like um, the different options really apply we really see that for mental health for well-being body coordination community feeling and in integration it's something very important to have and I think it's something that we all uh, try to develop within our uh, different organization because uh, it's um, most of the time mental uh, support or psychological support is not really provided in the situations of uh, the different refugee camp. So it's quite uh, difficult to, to offer something that can uh, support people in that uh, scenario and sport is a quite a very good answer for that um, so like all the the and also community feeling it's quite something that uh, people see as something that support also the the, the the different individuals and when coming together and doing sport together people feel better uh, and that's something I think we all uh, saw in our different uh, organization and uh, across um, people doing sports in general. I will switch to the next question. And uh, I want to ask you, what do you, how do you think, like how many people do you think we can reach uh, through all the work of uh, Abibi work, yoga and sport and refugee per month? If you think it's 500, 1,000, 2,000 or 5,000 people uh, that uh, come to all the different activities that all the organizations are offering in Lesbos, in Ioannina uh, and in Refugim, uh, what, are, like, what are your thoughts and how many people do you think are uh, uh, coming to participate? 5,000 is a, <laughs> will be quite, uh, yeah. I leave you a few minutes more to answer, maybe.
Yeah, I think the right answer is 2000 because already with yoga and sport in a normal scenario where there is no coronavirus, of course, we cover around 1000. We, we have like 1000 people coming to all the activities. So to the gym, to like the football fields and everything, to the running, to the swimming, uh, we are able to, to offer uh, sports for around 1000 people. Um, and I also assume that at least uh, three to 400 people are coming uh, well, at different times uh, to both ABB work and refugee. So per month, I think yeah, it's around 2000 uh, people that can uh, come and uh, benefit from the, from the sports uh, or, well, activities. Then the next, next question, and it's an uh, open question. Do you know example of successful refugee athletes? And then you can uh, give some names if you know some. I leave you also uh, around one, two minutes to reply. Well, thank you a lot for the replies. I don't know all uh, the different athletes that are written. I know Mo Farah for sure is uh, one of the most famous uh, runners and marathon runners. And I think we can also add uh, uh, Mardini, uh, Yasra Mardini, who is a very uh, well-known swimmer. Yeah, uh, it's already here. <laughs> And there is also Ramla Ali, a very famous uh, boxer, uh, woman. And yeah, but there is quite, quite a lot of uh, refugees that are uh, very successful athletes in uh, different places. I don't know Lopez, Lamont, Nadia, but uh, if you want to add their story in the chat, that would be really nice. But thank you for all the replies. And I will go to the next question. And this question is about how, like, from your perspective and from what you know, uh, do you think it's possible for men and women refugees to mix in gender sport activities? Yes or no? And uh, we can, of course, uh, talk uh, about it and have more. background information, of course. I don't know if anyone is replying right now, but I don't see yet any results. For the new people who joined, I resent the, the survey link in the general chat with the code. Um, so you can try to answer for this question. Thank you, Iman. So I will reply and I think maybe Suela, you can give also a small reply about this. What do you think about this question? For you, it's possible? Yeah. Okay. And why? <laughs> why? Mm, according to me, the only reason that, for example, in the question you asked that, for example, why or how, for example, it's possible that men and women, they should, for example, they should be refugee and they should do 
sports or activities together. Yeah. According to me, for example, like a man and a woman, there's no difference between them. Like the power and the things that a man is having, the same is woman is having that too. So there's no difference between each other. All should be equal. Thank you. You're welcome. But I think it's also like sometimes difficult in terms of the uh, cultural differences that we have and uh, well we have people from very different background coming to the uh, to do the sports and sometimes it's easier sometimes it's diffi more difficult for men and for women to mix but we have a few uh, very good example where we see and uh, also Suela uh, will talk maybe about it later also but she's have a class where um, men and uh, women are mixed and we see it more and more uh, growing, fortunately, in our different uh, classes. And it's something that's really, really important because it's something we really want to focus and have. Uh, and I think it's the same for Habibi work and as well for Refugim that we really try to push uh, integration and mix in uh, sport activities um, for people to, to be uh, together. Can I jump in and, and say something? Yeah, yeah, of course. It's, a, it's, it's really interesting um, because when we first started Refugium, uh, one of the first things that we did before actually like going ahead with any of um, the other activities before we even started the gym is we, um, I attended a community meeting and so I spoke to as many community representatives as possible and said, okay, we have this idea of starting a gym and like sports and exercise classes how do you feel about it and like how do you want that to look so I didn't just want to come in and tell the community okay we're going to do this this and this but rather okay I want you guys to be at the forefront of this and I, I want you to lead this and what was a really resounding um, opinion was that they, they really wanted the classes um, to be separated and so so that's what we did um, and so so we work in Malakasa, as I've said, and that's um, a predominantly Afghan community, which is why I find it also super interesting what you say, Sohaila, as well, right? Because you're Afghan. Um, and so, yeah, in, 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 in this particular community that we work with, the women, especially like the feedback that they give, is that they want to be with just other women because they feel safer and they feel better and they feel more able to express themselves. So I think it's super interesting um, even within the same communities, like there, there can be, there can be differences. Yeah, that's really true, and uh, it's uh, it really depends on who is uh, coming to the to the classes. And of course, we don't have the same. Uh, well, we don't have the same in gyms in Europe, for example, and it's not such a, a, a problem or a taboo to be um to like mix but yeah indeed for uh, the community and as yeah you mentioned for suhela it was i mean for you it was easy to join with men you didn't have a problem yeah, but sure. for other women that you know they also want mm -hmm. to have like a specific uh, time and a specific place where they feel indeed safe and where no one can can see or interact so that's really really true thank you for the for the comment and I think we can get started now after this small icebreaker, we can get started with the first uh, panel panelist. And I will give the floor to Elske and Kiki and uh, to present, of course, uh, the power of sports as a universal language. And my first question to them will be if they can share a little bit uh, with us how they first uh, got the running group started in uh, um, in the, the situation of uh, Habibi works? Yes. Um, so we touched upon the sub subject of uh, mental well-being and well-being in general already quite a, quite a bit. Um, and really the reason why me and Elske started to run uh, is because we needed an, an outlet, a kind of balance. Um, and uh, being situated just across from the camp on our morning run, we would uh, come across uh, a few other people that were running uh, early in the mornings. We would see some people from the camp doing sports activities. And this was initially the, the 
the reason why we thought, why can't we just all run together? For the people who already have an interest in running, they are running um, in the mornings, we could set up a running group in order to, um, to also, well, to encourage the ones who are already running to, to join a, uh, a, a group um, so that we have a little bit of the sense of uh, the sense of community also to get to know each other in a different way um, outside of let's say the working hours in uh, in Habibi Works um, and uh, from that it kind of started uh, at first uh, casually and we just kind of spread information uh, through I mean, by mouth, um, word, word to word, uh, and we got a few more people joining us. Uh, and then very early on, we uh, decided uh, that we are that we're going to train, train for something for something bigger, that we're going to uh, train for something, uh, train for an actual event, uh, a running event. Um, to participate with the with the local running group or with the running group from uh, Camp Katsika uh, at this at this um, running event, um, and uh, yeah, and so we um, we uh, had a group of about uh, twenty, including the two of us runners. Uh, that uh, participated in the, let's say, initial starting event where in which the, the running group kind of uh, came to be. Um, and the beautiful thing was that after we had uh, come across the, or we, we had uh, finished the first, the first event, the first race, uh, the running group continued, which made me and Elske really happy. Um, because we had, this was this was uh, in the beginning when we started. Uh, we didn't know if this was a short term or long term project. Um, it was really beautiful to see that after the first event, people were still motivated and uh, wanted to continue. So the, that we actually continued with the running group. Um, well, until uh, until I left in the summer of two thousand nineteen. So a little bit over a year, we participated in a variety of different running events um, where different people also at different point in a different point in time joined. Um, and uh, yeah, this is how it came to be. Well, thank you a lot for uh, introducing the, the running group. And one question comes to me already. Uh, what was the re response when you were going to these local events and with the, the Greek uh, population or with the other runners? Did you have a good interaction? Uh, yeah, I think the beautiful thing about uh, doing sports, and this is where this whole idea of the sport being a universal language comes in, is that uh, people connect with each other doesn't matter where you're from, how old you are, what your background is, um, and you could really feel that vibe at, at, the, at the running events. At the first events we, uh, event we participated was a half marathon in, um, in correct me if I'm wrong, Elske, end of April, or the first of, first of end of April? End of March. Uh, oh, end of March, that's yeah. right. <laughs> end of March uh, 2018. Um, and uh, and the, the half marathon took place in Olympia, which is also uh, a historic uh, place in Greece uh, connected uh, to sports. Um, and so the general feedback from the organizers of the event was extremely positive. They supported also us with the participation fees uh, and also a lot of the people who participated in the race were very positive, very supportive. And uh, many, many runners told us afterwards that throughout the half marathon, they had made several connections with people on the wilds running. 
Well, that's that's super cool to hear and to know that it's quite uh, like bonding people to run together and especially through uh, an event. And uh, I heard that well, at some point you you started also raising awareness with the running group about the refugee crisis, uh, and you had a slogan and it was running for freedom of movement. Can you tell us a little bit more about the experience or it was related also to the races? Yeah, so we um, once we decided we wanted to run for a certain goal, which in the, in the first occasion was this half marathon, we thought it would actually be great to use the opportunity also to do some awareness racing. Um, so we thought we, like, we want to raise awareness for something that all the people of our group, um, yeah, which was very uh, present in their situation, which was um, freedom of movement. And uh, also because obviously movement, you're running, but then it's a bit like uh, ironic that basically they don't have the complete freedom of movement because they cannot actually move there where they would like to go. So this was um, the idea we had. And we also did a fundraising campaign to fundraise the whole event. So um, like the trip there and uh, equipment and all these kind of things. So through this, um, we could, could also um, spread this message to the people who would donate, for example. And also during the events, then the themselves we would like raise awareness for it uh, and uh, from runners world which was super nice because um it yeah it actually spread a bit further than we thought it would it was runners world usa i think um and also some of the local news um so it was super nice People were also really interested and engaging. So um, yeah, it was it was a very interesting experience. Well, and you really developed that uh, regarding the the sport. One of the values is that sports is a universal uh, language. Do you think you can share a little bit more about why is is it a universal language and uh, where do you see the sport as a connection and uh, integration for people who are uh, coming to the sport or who are also like uh, outside of the refugee community but want to uh, be linked or share a bond together? Uh, yes, certainly. So the, the sport as a universal language, I, I think um, it really, this idea really became quite prominent within the running group um, because we had people from so many different parts of the world uh, joining the joining the running group so uh, there are always language barriers there are cultural barriers um, uh, there's political barriers that uh, can be quite challenging to deal with and I think a lot of people who have worked in uh, the setting a refugee setting or close to a refugee camp uh, know that many times there are conflicts between different groups uh, or different different or different parts of the world uh, and what we really saw is uh, uh, that within the group uh, friendships were created that um, that might have and I can't say that for certain but that might not have developed um, uh, without this this uh, common interest for sport um, and that was really beautiful because it also um, it also extended uh, from the from the running group to the immediate circle of the running group to the friends and family and you could really see people from different parts of the world uh, mingling and mixing together it also really uh, motivated a lot of the people um, that participated uh, in um, in uh, in doing sports by themselves or being trying to be involved in other uh, sports activities in in the region, um, also other people from the camp. So the enthusiasm the enthusiasm was also shared with other people from the camp, and we would be approached by 
uh, different people, uh, also different age groups, a lot of um, a lot of the younger ones as well, which was challenging because we participated mainly in really long runs. Uh, there were was two or three uh, runs we participated in where actually teenagers and children could participate, but anything that is more than 10 kilometers is or even more than five kilometers actually for for anybody under the age of 18 is, is become, becoming a little bit more challenging. Um, so the longer one runs were really targeted uh, for uh, anybody uh, above the age of 18. Um, in terms of integration, I do have to say it was a little bit more challenging. Um, and that is because we initially hoped that uh, through time, there would also be uh, local people joining us uh, from the uh, village of Katsika, or maybe even people from Ioannina. But given that we were extremely close to the camp and also outside of the village, um, it made it very difficult for, for people to join. Um, and so I think the integration part um, mainly happened uh, in the sense that um, we are our running group was uh, by the time that I left quite known in Ioannina because we had participated in different events in uh, two smaller runs in a 30 kilometer lake run and in a half marathon um, and so uh, many of uh, uh, many people that were uh, that were in this, let's say, in the sports uh, sector in Ioannina were aware of us. Um, and like I said, it did motivate also uh, some of the runner, runners to also participate in, in other, um, other sports activities. A lot of people from the camp were, were really eager to participate in local sports uh, uh, initiatives. Some of them did, um, but obviously there's there's a lot of challenges that come with that, such as um, just as financial means, uh, but also there's a lot of systematic uh, challenges, such as uh, many of the the, the guys um, who were part of our running group uh, initially are, are footballers or are interested in in football. Uh, and they really wanted to uh, play in the local team or be considered to play in the local team, play against other local teams. Um, and because a lot of them didn't have um, the right documentation, they could not participate, which is, was, was kind of sad and also uh, was the reason why, in that sense, integration only came to a certain point. So in the end, the also a group of guys from the camp uh, set up a football team by themselves, but that meant they couldn't actually play together with with uh, Greeks in Ioannina. Um, I think I've already started to talk a little bit about the challenges. If you want, yeah. Estelle, I can just continue. No, it's great. Thank you so much for already approaching the question. And uh, yeah, I would like to hear more about the challenges that you faced, but also to know a little bit how did you like how did you gain experience uh, by doing this work and finding the way over this or some of the obstacles that you might have uh, seen and that was what you were telling about basically with the uh, football team also because they couldn't join so they made their own football team of course like in that sense it's a uh, um, parallel so there is no real integration but it still can be an integration when the team can play together maybe as a friendly ma friendly game or something so uh, please continue thank you yes uh, okay i'll talk a little bit more about challenges before i give the floor back to elska who's who will talk a little bit about uh, the approaches and maybe the lessons learned um that we have uh, gathered through this uh, very intense experience um so since we started very early on with a specific goal and the specific goal in the first instance was to participate in a half marathon uh, we kind of targeted 
uh, let, let me say, a more homogenous group uh, in terms of age and gender. Um, it was not our intention at all to, to have a male only running group, but as it so happened, um, everybody who, who was interested in, in joining and training for the half marathon uh, was male. Um, and also between the age range of uh, 18 and maybe 35. Um, because it was such a big distance from the very beginning, I think also a lot of people were a little bit um, shy to participate. Uh, and since we were training also for this specific uh, for this specific goal, uh, it was it was quite hard to integrate in the let's say uh, pre um, pre running phase or pre uh, pre half marathon phase uh, to integrate people that wanted to just join but run but not actually participate in the training. And um, I think that is something we had a hard time to um to 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 integrate in a way where we could still uh allow people to train with us uh because else and i were training ourselves um and so uh, running slower running small distances um we weren't so flexible in that initial uh, phase before the before the run um afterwards we we saw a lot of of different people uh joining because they were uh, inspired and interested um but every time when we uh, we would approach another uh, running event um it was it was quite a it was quite a tailored group um then the another challenge that we faced and i think this is a challenge that we are we everybody in this in this field uh, is dealing with quite a lot is is the challenge of commitment um, and uh, that obviously uh, has several different reasons why why there's issues with commitment um, a lot of people don't want to commit to anything because uh, committing to something also means that you're accepting that you're staying in a place maybe longer than you anticipate. Um, and, and that was very challenging because we really needed people to commit because we had to uh, register. We had to make sure that everybody is fit enough to participate. We obviously also didn't want anybody to, to participate if they're not healthy or fit enough and then uh, have issues at the actual run. Um, and that was sometimes very frustrating for us because um, it seemed, I think sometimes to people, it seemed as though we were trying to push them too hard. Um, yeah, and uh, we, me and Elske were running behind people, encouraging them to please join the trainings like we discussed. And uh, that was something we struggled with uh, quite a bit. Um, and uh, I think this is something that Elske will, will talk about more, but as we, we in hindsight, um, organized everything ourselves. And maybe this was also one of the reasons why commitment uh, sometimes was not as, as high as other times, uh, because people were, did not feel as involved in the process as we, if we would have uh, involved them for all stages. Um, yeah, I think those are the main challenges we had to deal with. Thank you a lot, Kiki, for uh, uh, well talking about the challenges. And if uh, uh, Elske want to continue about talking about a little bit the uh, perspective that and the, the lessons that you've learned through the this work, and how did you overcome maybe some of these uh, obstacles? Uh, that would be really uh, great. I don't know if Elsko, you can hear me or? Yeah, I just need to unmute her one second. I think she's okay. Sorry, I'm back. I don't know what happened to my connection, but uh, <laughs> I'm back. 
thank you. I don't know if you heard the question already. No, no, okay. sorry. No problem. I will repeat uh, for you. So it's um, if you can uh, tell us a little bit more about. So Kiki already talked about um, the like most of the obstacles that you could that you had and uh, some of the yeah of the difficulties that you faced during the um, growing of the running group and of the sports in general and now we would like to ask uh, you if you can tell us a little bit more about what lesson you learned uh, what knowledge you developed uh, through the work you did and uh, how did you overcome like some of the obstacles uh, in terms of like yeah commitment or in terms of integration or having a different age group like yeah in terms of yeah. in your second you had thank you um yeah so as kiki was saying commitment was quite um a challenge at times and um Sometimes I think it was a bit difficult for people that we pushed them so much because we were quite strict actually. We really said if you want to participate in this run, you have to come at least to a certain amount of trainings because otherwise your body will not be fit enough and we don't want to be the cause of your injuries. So we were quite strict and I think even though it was a bit difficult sometimes, um, this also created a lot of commitment because it was ver a very clear goal where we were moving to and everyone knew that when it would happen and which just gave a sort of um, more tangible um, timeline somehow. So it also pushed people more to really come every day and not think, oh, I want to sleep and the next day again, oh, I want to sleep. I have to say there were also times that we knocked on people's doors <laughs> to get them out of their beds. But um, yeah, like I think having a goal to work to, especially for running, really helped to create this, this commitment. And um, what we also saw, what also relates to doing these events that, well, first of all, it's great for, the, for integration reasons. Like these were the main moments that I really think there was a form of integration into the local society, which was really nice to see. And also um, the runners really appreciated these sort of these achievements. Like it's, it's a really good feeling if you finished a half marathon or even a marathon. Um, like it's something that you can be really proud of. And I think in the lives of a lot of people, because it's so much just waiting and not really filled with, anything um, not everyone of course but for a lot of them this was it was like this um, these small successes really meant a lot to them and there was this one guy who um, who was wearing his medals for I think at least a month <laughs> after they did the race so yeah that was really nice to see um, then um, and also a lot of the guys that that we knew from then uh, are still running now, even though they moved on or are in different parts of the world. So um, yeah, that's also really nice to, to see. And then what Kike was already saying, like the, um, the whole organizational part of, of the running, um, or at least of the events, Kike and I would usually like do. So we would organize the fees, we would organize the transport, we would, get the funds in and all of this. And in hindsight, we think that it would actually have been better if we would have involved people more because now it sometimes felt to some people, like most people just really enjoyed it, but there were some people that had a little bit the feeling that we sort of made them do this, whereas that was never our point, obviously, like we just wanted for the people who wanted to run to facilitate also events and these kind of things. And I do think that um, if we would have involved them in the, in the whole process, they would also have seen all the effort that it takes to set something up and they would probably have felt a bit more um, ownership over the whole, the whole thing, um, which I think might have improved the, um, yeah, the, the whole atmosphere. Though, yeah, most people, as I said, really enjoyed it. It was just a few people that mm, had some uh, 
discussion points, <laughs> let's put it like that. So um, I think those were the main, the main things that we really learned. Okay. Well, that's really good to know and also to improve for ourselves. Like in yoga and sport, we also take part in uh, running races sometimes. And it's really good to know that, that then we can also try to engage and involve more the community to like uh, participate, but also prepare uh, for the event. Yeah, so that's really good to, to know. Yeah. Yeah. And also even coming up, for example, with the, um, the running um, like routine and stuff like this, we sort of imposed it we didn't really impose it but like we we found these routines that you would have to follow to in a healthy way train for a half marathon for example and yeah. um i think if they would have looked for these kind of things themselves and looked for the information then they would know why it is so important to do it like this and obviously we explained our thoughts but i still think it's really different if yeah. people are the like they themselves would do the research and it motivates from a different angle somehow. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know and to, uh, to think about for uh, the future also. Thank you a lot, uh, Elske, for, uh, um, well, for explaining more and developing more about uh, the, the lesson learned. And now I think it's time for a few questions. Uh, for Elske and Kiki from the audience. So I will give the floor to Iman to ask uh, these questions. Thank you, Estelle. Um, Kiki and Elske, thank you for giving such a holistic overview, not just the, the dreamy aspect, but also the real realistic uh, challenges. Um, so we have a few questions from the audience and if there's still any more questions left, you can send them in the, in the chat. Uh, but someone asked, um, if children are encouraged to be involved with sports and yoga activities. And maybe Elske and Kiki, you can contextualize a little bit um, about the kids policy about Habibi Works and um, maybe when children, when children are involved, how and, and why. Yeah, so in, um, like in Habibi Works itself, we have a policy that kids can only come on Saturdays. Um, this is because it's a, it's a space where there's lots of dangerous machines like saws and I don't know what, where you can really hurt yourself. And it's, first of all, not safe to have kids around all the time. And second of all, it doesn't really leave the peace and quiet for people to focus if there's kids running around. Um, especially not if their parents are in a project and not really like looking after their kids very thoroughly. So this is why we have this policy and um, it's also why we on Saturdays do allow kids and also really focus on kids and kids only. So all the activities we do um, are focused on kids. And on Saturdays we actually have um, also kids sports activities that Iman also uh, guided a lot, which, was, which is really nice. And um, as for running, we actually had kids joining the trainings sometimes but only the the shorter ones um because as kiki said we would be training at some point for a marathon so we would also the training runs would be quite uh, tough and it's just not really healthy for a kid to run that long so um the shorter ones sometimes they could join also because this this running was not in heavy work so we were not bound to the age limit but um yeah to the races themselves they were too long for the kids. Kids were not even allowed to, to follow them. Yeah, and um, on Saturdays, like Elska mentioned, we do have activities that are specific for kids. So at some point we had kids boxing and that was facilitated from people within the community actually. So we had like boxing athletes and they would commit to teaching the children and they really enjoyed it. Um, okay, so there's another question which I think you eventually answered, but if you want to add anything to it, uh, feel free to. Uh, but someone asked a really important question. So how can you make the emphasis on local self-management of the sports, run for and by the refugees themselves, uh, so train the trainers, to avoid the need of an ongoing NGO presence um, or outside facilitation? So I think Kiki and Elska, you already mentioned that Early on, you would have preferred to involve people to feel agency, but 
are there any other things that you consider? And I think later on yoga and sports um, for refugees will get to this a little bit about their model, but um, if you have anything to add, Nelska, go ahead. Kiki, you want to say something? Say. <laughs> okay. Well, I think from our side, as I said, like we would have uh, in hindsight already included them much more in the organizing of the events themselves and of uh, the training schedule and all these kind of things. I think this would have been good, though, um, like as asked in the question, how can you make it sustainable without the constant need of an NGO? I think in our situation at least it would have been quite difficult because people move on all the time so there the people move on quite quickly sometimes so if you have people that are the core of this running group and then in half a year they're not there anymore you would continuously need to find people who sort of carry it um i guess it's possible but it would it would be difficult i think i don't know kiki what do you think um I think uh, actually it, it also really depends on, on what kind of, I think what you said, Elske is totally right. It, it's sometimes very hard to set something like that up because there's so much uncertainty about the future of, of where people are and what they will do. Um, so this is also why maybe some people are not, not willing to, to set things up that they might be able to easily carry by themselves. In terms of, uh, Running, I have to say, running is one of the easy things where you do not necessarily need uh, need a trainer, but everybody can run at any point in time. It doesn't matter if you have a trainer or not. So I think it becomes much more uh, important and valuable in uh, the experiences from uh, from the others where they really teach um, different kind of sports. Uh, where where you need certain skills in or, in order to transmit them, uh, and as El, uh, El, as Iman was saying, uh, in Habibi Works on Saturdays, um, there was uh, an uh, a, an athlete who um, really wanted to share his skills with the children, and it was one of the highlights of everybody's week. Uh, the kids, his uh, ours as well. And I think also for the parents who, uh, whose kids participate in the boxing training, it was it was really incredible. Awesome, thank you, Kiki. Um, there was another question, but I'll I'll save it for later. Which generally asked if um, if sports is a way that um, like through sports, if refugees can integrate quickly into new communities. So I think Kiki and Elska, you already mentioned ways that integration happened, not fully successfully with. Uh, the local community because of simple uh, barriers such as geographic location and also maybe there, there should be thought about why people are so geographically isolated and how that makes it harder but I'll leave this question for um, for Suhaila and Mona because they will probably explore it a little bit more and great I think that that's it for the questions for now well, thank you a lot, Iman, and thank you, Elsko and Kiki, for uh, re answering the question of the audience. I'll now uh, give the floor to Suhela to talk about, uh, well, how she uh, became a karate athlete and how she became a karate teacher also within uh, the, the gym that we have in Lesbos. And I will start with the first question for Suhela, uh, just to introduce a little bit uh, about her sport. So, uh, Suhela, you have played karate for now quite some time. And can you tell us a little bit more about how did you start karate and uh, for how long you are practicing and what is your level if you add competitions? Yeah, sure. Okay, now I just want to talk about karate. And first, I want to share and I want to say that what does karate itself mean? First, karate as you all know that it's a Japanese martial art and it means that to fight eight empty hands. And when I was uh, six years old, I was really and really, I was child and I was uh, really happy and I was really motivated to go with my brothers at gym or to practicing at gym with them. 
but my family, they are not giving me permission to go because they're saying that, no, you're small, maybe something happened at you, for example, while fighting or while, um, for example, when you're fighting with each other or, for example, while practicing, something will happen. Don't go like this, like that. Only my wish is that, for example, my wish was only this, that, for example, I should go and I should be a fighter or a karate player one day. And then when I was 10, uh, 10 years old, my family just gave me permission or for example, I myself say to them that please and please just give me permission that I should go to, for example, one day I should show that, yeah, for example, to you guys, to my family or other persons that, yeah, for example, all the girls, for example, all the women, they can be a fighter also. Yeah, so and um, uh, I just practice my karate at Pakistan and I born there. I just practiced there for three years in Pakistan. Then my family just decided that we must should go from here, from Pakistan, cause in Pakistan we were refugees also. Then we just come back, uh, we just come back to Afghanistan, to Kabul, and we was there for one month and I just uh, did my training there also. Then when we was at Turkey, when we arrived there, I was having the only wish that I must should find a karate club for myself to do my training. But unfortunately, there we was having, for example, many problems, like we must should arrive at Greece. Then the only wish that on that time was having to arrive at Lesbos or Greece. When we just arrived at Greece, at Lesbos, the first day that we arrived, I was become shocked that, oh my God, where am I? Or for example, in which place we have camp? We just came from Afghanistan to have a better place, or for example, to have a safe place, for example, to have a bright future, but what's going on here? And finally, I'm just searching about the gym and about a place to do my trainings. But hopefully I asked many people that, for example, is there any gym? inside camp or next to camp that we should go for training like this. Then they were saying to me that no, inside camp, unfortunately we're not having any gym to practice. Even for example, we're not having a good place to learn some languages, but we're having one gym is somehow far, but uh, maybe it's possible for you that you should go and join. The first day that we arrived and um, at the second day I just came and I just uh, find Uganda sport for refugees. And the first time I just talked with Estelle about the karate class. Yeah, so uh, she said that, yeah, we are having karate class. Maybe, for example, we can do that. Yeah, so hopefully I just, uh, and hopefully I just uh, find a karate club or, for example, a place that I should do my trainings. Yeah. I can clearly remember the first time that we met with uh, Suhela and uh, we were in the self-defense uh, class for women and she came and uh, I totally, I understood when she took my hand to do the training that she was in sport before and she was in martial art before and then I told her, okay, just come and try to uh, join with the mix uh, class with yeah. the Muay Thai and the first time I think you came for the Muay yeah, Thai sure, yeah. and then you asked me oh, if it was possible also to teach karate for yeah. other people and then uh, from there, uh, yeah, I leave you to explain a little bit your experience and uh, how did you make like the karate group? How did that happen that you started teaching to students that came? How, how was this? Yeah, you're right. For the first day that I went in gym, it was multi class. I just, for example, it was mixed class, men and women, but for me, it was normal. And I just did my training there. And I was asking about karate class, from myself that it's possible that uh, we should have a karate class too, like for example, for men and for women. Then she said, that, yeah, of course, it's very good that, for example, we should have a mix and, for example, we should, and, uh, we should say to all that, yeah, for example, men and women can do his or her own training with, uh, for example, with mixed classes. And um, just, it was um, uh, one, one week? Yeah, after one after week, one yeah. Week. After one week, um, hopefully, we had our karate class with my partner with Nasib 
and he's also a karate teacher. So we we talked that, for example, which time, for example, how we should to have a karate class, have a good karate class for all, or for example, how um, how we should do the ways that they should learn easily. This. So you're also teaching uh, kids? Yeah. And you teach different ages also in your class, uh, yeah. when I saw. And how did you find the people that were interested in karate? In, in Moria camp directly, they came to you because they heard about karate? Or how it was that you created the, <coughs> the class, the group? Yeah. Mm, when I just, when there are many boys, I mean that they saw me in Uganda school for refugees while training. And they make me inside camp also that, oh my God, yeah, we saw you inside, uh, inside the gym and you're doing training there. And many girls that they were really interested, but unfortunately their families, they're not giving them permission. Then I just say to them that no problem, for example, just say to your parents that, for example, I want to do sports and I love that, for example, while I'm going to gym, I'm doing my own sports and not having any work to anyone else. But unfortunately, from 100 person in Moya camp, the, for example, from 85% the girls, they are too much interested, like for example, in martial arts, like boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai, Karate, Kung Fu, everything, but they are not having the permission that they should come. Yeah. So it's difficult, it's more easy for boys to join your class than for a woman, but then did you like face any challenge when you were teaching, uh, when you were doing, because so <laughs> for having permission for women and for girls to come, it was a challenge for you to uh, be, um, to have them join in the class, but for you, was it a challenge to teach for the boys? Did you have uh, any problem with that? Or <laughs> did they always respect you and they were always good with you? Uh, and also how it was with uh, Nassim, you always had a good uh, collaboration with him, or it was? Uh, I was having really good times, for example, while doing my class, even with Nassim, that he's my partner, and I just like him too much. Always, for example, he's supporting me, and I'm supporting her, him, sorry, and for example, when there are some boys in my class, or for example, some girls maybe for example some boys they're coming and for example they're giving so much comment like for example oh my god see her or for example what's he what's she doing like this like that i just don't care or for example one day there was one boy that just i don't know he asked me that oh my, uh, can i join your class then i said that of course you can it's for you guys that you should come and join then for example while training he was passing me too much comments. Then I said that no problem, it's okay. I should be busy with my own words. Yeah, so um, I had challenges uh, in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, I had eight challenges in Pakistan with uh, Pakistani people. And like, yeah, okay. I had eight competitions in Pakistan, like, for example, at um, many different places. Lahore, or for example, inside Pakistan, with uh, Pakistan, for example, with uh, Pakistani people, and when we came at Kabul, fortunately, there was one competition also that they asked me if you want to join, and I joined that also because I was a minor. Because of that, for example, I just win the match, and they asked me that if you want to go to the another country, like it was at India, mm -hmm. the final fight, it was at India. But they asked me about my, for example, my passport, about these things. Yeah. Unfortunately, because I was a minor, because of that, I didn't get the main. The yeah. to go. Okay. I hope that in the future it will be possible. Sure, inshallah. It will be. And in Europe also. Sure. Uh, and another question, how would you recommend to like people from the refugee community who want to teach uh, sports in the camp or where they are uh, in the different countries or different cities where they are what advice what uh, uh, um, like what would you tell them to do for example if they are very good in uh, Muay Thai or in uh, dancing 
uh, or in karate, uh, what do you what would you suggest for them if they want to start uh, a class, for mm -hmm. example? Only I want to suggest them and advise them. For example, the guys, for example, I'm I myself I'm also refugees and I can, for example, we all are in the same situation. Like for example, now I'm living in Moya. It's the best situation. Even for example, if there and if there should be anyone else, even they didn't want to come out from tank, it's the best situation. But I want to share and I want to say that them that for example, always be strong. Like for example, if there should be the best situation for you, never stop the words that you want to achieve them and it's your goal. For example, like in Moya, there are for example there are many girls they're having for example many things and they know many things they're having for example good skills but only the reason that they can't do or they can't continue their work their jobs or their words that they want to have that in the future the only reasons that they stop their works is the is the uh, cause of their uh, situation in moya so i want to say that uh, never think or never say that, yeah, cause of this bad situation, cause that you're not having good place to stay, you're not having good food to eat. It should not be the reason, yeah, or for example, if you're not having good place to sleep even at night. It should not be the only reason that, for example, you should get far from your goals, get far from your aims that you're having that and you want to do that in future never be for example never say like this that yeah for example it's not possible that i should this that i should do my work here or for example i'm not having this equipment i'm not having that yeah so this was my advice or suggest to all the refugees in the world that they're having many things and they know many things like for example there is they're for example doing or they know boxing or like for example many sports or for example different sports that they know so always they must should keep and they must should uh, do that in the hard situation you're welcome you're welcome i want to uh, give the floor now to iman if there was maybe one question because we are running a little bit out of uh, time maybe one question from the audience for suhela yeah, uh, for now there aren't any questions, but um, after we share Mona's story, there's a few general questions which I'll open to the floor to everyone. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I will directly, uh, well, thank you again, Suhela, a lot. And uh, we will come back with other questions from sure. the audience. And uh, Mona, if your microphone is working, can you? make a sound or a sign if not i will share a little bit about the story of uh, mona and uh, how she came to yoga and sport and what uh, what happened uh, and why she's uh, now one of our teachers um i don't know if mona you can talk if your microphone is working otherwise i start yeah i think you can go ahead for now okay so the Moni, Mona came first, uh, she was interested in different uh, sports and but especially in uh, yoga and she started uh, with like participating in the fitness class for women and in the yoga class for women and now uh, she basically um, with joining a lot of the different classes and uh, being more like every every single woman classes of yoga she was there and she was uh, like going along and really interested in how uh, she could uh, meditate and reflect and have all the the good uh, assets of the yoga so she became first a very very uh, committed student of the yoga classes and then uh, little bit by little bit, she was very linked to some of the yoga teachers that we had uh, coming as volunteers because it was difficult to have uh, a refugee uh, volunteer teaching the yoga class uh, because it's not a very popular uh, sport activity in, uh, in 
uh, within the country of origin of uh, uh, many refugees in Lesbos. Um, and uh, for Mona as well, uh, she was not practicing before she came to, to Lesbos and to the um, One Happy Family Community Center and to uh, yoga and sport uh, gym. And then when she started uh, to, to do yoga, she really felt uh, all the, the benefits. And I will uh, share with you what, why uh, yoga is important for, for Mona. Um, so for her, it's very important because it's help her to strengthen strength her, her body. And it's for also a lot of students important because that's uh, what they feel when they are exercising. And when she's doing yoga, she feels like she can control her body and concentrate uh, in her body at the focus. So she really see the mind and the body connection uh, within the, uh, the, the, the sport and uh, during the class. Uh, and she stops thinking about everything. So she can really focus only about the, the sport. And for her, it's very um, something that's very important. And I think it's very um, like, for all the sports uh, activities that we have, that the uh, mental health being is really so a key for for all the activities uh, that are in existing and for everyone doing sports in general. And for her, it's became yoga became really a lifestyle, and she's trying to encourage people to uh, do yoga because it's really for her a stress relief and something that she used to feel stronger as well. So it's an asset for her to feel more confident and to feel better and to feel stronger. So like that's how after being a student for many, um, many months, she started to uh, be willing to teach uh, with Miren, our volunteer, uh, uh, volunteer yoga teacher. And she started to also be interested in a, a teacher training, a yoga teacher training that we will do in August and uh, in September in Lesbos. And now she wants to um, study and learn how to be a certified yoga teacher um, because she really feels that uh, she wants to share this passion with other people and share the, the stress relief power that uh, yoga also, also has. Um, so that's a little bit about Mona's story. Now, if you have any questions for Mona and for Suela, please uh, just type them in the chat and we'll be very happy to, to reply. And I don't know, Iman, if you already have some questions. Yeah, thank you, Estelle. Uh, so someone asked earlier, and so these questions are for, um, for all of the panelists. If it's relevant to you, you feel free to answer. Uh, so someone asked, do any of your programs target teenage girls and boys? So I think um, Elske and Kiki, kind of, you already got to that. Um, maybe Britt or Estelle, if, if you have any other answer, you can share. Britt, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, in our experience, different sports um, attract different populations, different different groups within those populations. Um, you know, so for example, Zumba attracts women, volleyball attracts men, and uh, different sports attach, attract particularly teenagers. Um, so for the girls, uh, for, for a period we had a self-defense teacher from the community that really, really attracted, it was open to everybody, but it really attracted um, the teenage girls, somewhat understandably, you know, as a way to learn how to defend themselves if necessary and quite a big outlet for their energy as well with not much else going on in the camp um, aside from a bit of education but a, that was a really big outlet so that was really interesting to see um, unfortunately we no longer have um, self-defense teachers because the teacher moved on transient situation in a refugee camp um, and now we have um, Kung Fu lessons, which again are open to anybody female, which are run actually by our field manager. Um, so the woman who's in charge of overseeing the whole of refugee um, within the camp. Her name's Rukaya. And yeah, again, that just gets a lot of female, atten uh, female teenage attention. Um, and for the teenage boys, it's volleyball. They just, they just love it. <laughs> Thank you, Britt. Um, I'll just want add one more thing. So from the perspective of Habibi Works, some of the teenagers do fit into our um, age requirements. So some of them are 15 years and older. So some 
might participate in the gym, so they might come and use the gym. Um, but also, and maybe Oscar, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but sometimes if we have activities, we try to be considerate that we don't uh, take away their time from school. So um, this is not related to sports, but um, for example, Elska used to be involved with Science Wednesday. So there is a lot of consideration to balance which activities would take away time from other activities that are important. So synchronizing our time with other activities. Um, so I just wanted to add that. And Estelle, if do you, would you like to add anything else about um, having teenagers in your programs, um, teenage girls or boys? Sure, I think it's really, and as uh, also Suhela told, and she has also like some students that are a teenager, and I think for them when they have the permission from their parents, or even if they are unaccompanied minors, it's very important. We had a few also like example of uh, unaccompanied minors who, who went uh, to other countries because of their uh, like, um, they were selected because of their determination and motivation joining the classes, and it was, uh, for their guardian and for people uh, who were responsible to to like uh, see who uh, to like kind of choose uh, to go to Germany or Luxembourg or other places, it's also a, in a way that they see okay this person is also very motivated and they want to also give uh, give uh, another well a bigger chance maybe. Um, so we really try to have as many like minors or uh, teenagers as long as it's a safe uh, environment and safe space for them. Uh, we really try to involve them as much as uh, possible. Uh, of course, like when you said about the running, it's true that sometimes it's very difficult to involve uh, people when the kilometers are uh, longer and longer, but it's also, I think, uh, athletics are a great way to, to um, for teenagers to discover also their limits and to, to feel uh, how they can develop and, and uh, have more uh, um, fitness levels in their daily life. Yeah. Great, thank you, Estelle. Um, so there's one more question. We're just, we just want to be mindful for the time. Um, okay, so oh, now I'm debating between these two interesting questions. Um, so I'll, I'll just quickly start with this one and if anyone would like to share. So, what do you think can be the reasons why more people don't practice sports? So what are barriers that people might not practice sports? So we answered this a little bit. We talked about people feeling safe. So I, um, I think, so Haley, you talked about this, um, um, the feeling of comfort, uh, maybe the motivation. Um, people are in a very difficult situation, so that might be a barrier. Um, I think Aska and Kiki, you also talked about running, just the fact that it's so early might be a barrier. But if there's anything else in addition to that, um, please feel free to share. I think um, for um, what we've seen for the women, what is also a very big barrier is their daily task, uh, tasks in the household and the kids they have. So for example, we would be open from 11 to 6, and um, during those times, they would have to take care of the kids and do the cooking and whatever. So like this was often, uh, I think, a limitation for them to come because they might just have a task to do at the time there was sports and then they wouldn't be able to come. So I think this is quite a limitation. And I think you did very well in making a routine so that they sort of freed the time uh, because it was always at the same time. But yeah, I think this is another limit limitation people face sometimes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Um, yeah, so we, we, eventually got to, oh, sorry, yeah, we eventually got a routine down to come to sports, but it did take a long time. And like Oscar said, it took a long time to put consistent, consistency, that people know this time there's sports and I can jump in at any moment. Um, and some of them would bring their children, but it does take... The consistency does help, I think. And Estelle, if you wanted to share. Yeah, now Suela wanted also to share one of the obstacles of uh, why people don't, uh, don't come sometimes. According to me, the only reasons that, for example, the Afghan people or, for example, women or men that we are having, the only reason is that, that for example, uh, they're having family problem or for example yeah the only reason that we are having 
and I want to share from cause of Afghan people is this that for women they are not having fa family problems that they should come. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, Sohela. And um, Britta, do you want to share anything? Yeah, um, I just wanted to extend on on your and the point that you just made that I feel like consistency really is key in a in a camp environment or working with asylum seekers. There's so much inconsistency and we don't, don't know what each day is going to be so like creating a consistent timetable for us like definitely has been um a key to success so you know different demographics and class attendees know the routine and okay what what day what time their class is going to be so like you touched on Elska, they can they can make time for that and kind of like put their resp responsibilities aside just for this hour or two for themselves um, but to be brutally honest, like another thing, another issue that might put people off um, coming to classes or attending sports is what I've witnessed personally is um, because of the way that we run Refuge Gym, we, with being run by the refugee community, sometimes people are jealous of, of say for example, a the self-defense class that was run for girls and women um, and the men wanted a similar, not even necessarily self-defense, but at that time we had no specific martial arts for the boys. And so there was this jealousy that rose up and it, it created um, a little bit of unrest. And so the, the girls and women attending the self-defense class didn't feel safe. So safety can also be um, a barrier, like completely unintended. Obviously when you, when you schedule a self-defense class into an overall sports timetable, if you're doing a risk assessment for me personally i didn't think that okay jealousy would be an issue so i just wanted to point that out like sometimes these things occur that completely blindside you um and you have to work through them so yeah making sure that people feel safe at all times whilst participating in the sports classes and if they don't that can be a hindrance to them attending okay great thank you brit um so i just want to be mindful we're at the end of our time and if anyone feels um and you, like no pressure you can drop off the call uh, we will send at the end uh, some of the details for our closing remarks but um but yeah and estelle maybe you can take over for the closing remarks i just want to add one quick thing a, f a few small off topics were pointed out about um like gender and sports and safety and this is this might be one of the other webinars that we talk about because it's a huge topic and we can dig really deep into it. Um, so if you're interested, we, uh, let us know and we can keep you updated about um, any other webinar we have. That's it. Yeah. Thank you a lot, Iman. Uh, I think we are going a little bit uh, over time, but please stick with us. We'll be very short. I just wanted to share with you now like what we've been uh, working like the situation we've been working on for the past uh, years uh, it's been quite uh, like quite some time where we know that people are stuck in the situation and they are coming to like the Aegean Iceland I'm like Lesbos, Samos, Kios for example and then they are transferred to other camp but right now we are still able to facilitate and to have uh, the projects being uh, run uh, within the camp or like uh, in other places outside of the camp um, and that has been the current situation and what was happening before also the corona crisis of course but since uh, in Greece at least since the, the, the change of governments it became harder and harder for NGOs to work and to be uh, well to have access also inside of uh, uh, camps I'm thinking of uh, also refugee for example um, but it's something that um, must be highlighted that it becomes more and more uh, like the context is changing the situation is changing over the months and it's very difficult um, to now work in Greece and do uh, support uh, integration for refugees especially when now uh, the the, the law made that after six months of uh, acquiring your refugee status, basically you're not entitled to be supported anymore with accommodation and uh, cash, um, cash uh, help uh, support um, by the UNHCR or by uh, other um, organizations. So basically after six months you lose 
uh, when you have acquired your refugee status, you lose uh, every everything. You lose your home and you lose uh, the money that you were relying on to, to live. I think this is very important to, to highlight that now this is also happening, but it will be okay-ish if people could integrate directly and work and get uh, a form of a possibility to integrate in the Greek uh, community and in the Greek society to, to find a job and to, to work. But this is made very difficult right now. And I think it's very important to, to see that maybe in some places, in some uh, situations, uh, sport can really help with that. Uh, we have uh, some of our former teachers, and I think within maybe your teams also, uh, former teachers that found a job uh, in uh, like a football team in uh, Athens uh, and in different uh, scenarios where they can continue teaching sports. And I think this is really something that can be um, um, highlighted and that we can find a way maybe to, su to support more and more for uh, people that are in, uh, in Greece. And yeah, I wanted to, of course, invite all the audience if they have more ideas and if they know about ways to, to do this and to find uh, like coaching and, and trainings uh, for people to participate in, to have professional skills in sports, uh, if they want to send us any any knowledge that they have, that will be uh, really appreciated. Um, and I will leave uh, the last uh, floor for uh, Brit. I will have, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to make a, a call um, and how to, to um, give us more advocacy and more information about the situation. Thank you, Estelle. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to talk briefly about uh, things we can do, tangible things we can do to make a difference. So thank you everybody for coming, thank you for listening. Um, and now that you've listened to us, if you feel moved to do something, um, there are two tangible things that I'm going to suggest that you can do. Um, as Estelle has touched on, like information is, is really, really key to us in continuing our work. Um, and so we'd love to you know, further this platform of information sharing, um, be that, you know, like sports methodologies or grants that you come across, resources or even gyms that, you know, that would support us or support refugees and further in their training. And uh, across the board, this is a question we get asked quite a lot, um, particularly with our teachers, you know, who are professionals, okay, working in the, in the camp or, or, you know, in the setting is great, but how can I take it further? So yeah, to create a platform between us where we can share resources and information would be amazing just to, just to further our work and be advocates of each other. Um, so you can put that in the chat or in any follow-up emails or via our social media, etc. cetera. Um, and then the second tangible thing I recommend you doing is supporting advocacy groups and petitions that come out. So one that I specifically want to refer to is called um, Europe Must Act. Uh, you can find them online, particularly on Instagram, they're very active. Um, and it's a group of more than 160 grassroots NGOs like ourselves that are calling for a more humane policy on migration and asylum. So what Estelle has already touched on is that they're quite systematically making life more difficult for refugees, even if you are granted asylum, um, life then becomes very, very difficult. So we are a group of um, activists who yeah, are calling on more humane policies and if you choose to follow them then they post often about different peti petitions um, and things you can do as an, to be more active as an activist to, to get more involved in that. So I really recommend you following them, it's, it's really good information um, and can make a tangible difference. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Brit, and thank you to everyone. I think it's time uh, to close uh, the webinar. I want to thank you everyone for joining and all the panelists as well. Uh, and we really hope that we can uh, follow up 
on this first webinar and maybe make another one. Uh, and I will leave maybe a last word to Iman. Iman, you wanted yeah. to say something? Yeah, thank you, Estelle. Um, yeah, I just want to say um, that we'll follow up with an email with uh, information about uh, YSFR, Refugium, Habibi Works, and um, you can follow us um, on the social media links. We will also send um, one of the other ways that um, you can support is through donations. So we'll send links. Um, it's also an option. Um, and that should, that's basically it. And thank you to the panelists um, for coming here and sharing your experiences and challenges very honestly. Um, so that's it from my side. And I think uh, and if anyone else has any other comments, please feel free to share. I, I'd just like to add how, how interesting this has been to see from um, what we're fundamentally doing and our overall goals are the same, right? This is what we have in common, but to observe how, you know, not each group, not each project, not each refugee community is homogenous. There's quite big differences between us, you know, for example, specifically, refugees have never been able to get anybody interested in running, but like it's such a key part of what Habibi Works and Yoga and Sport for Refugees do. Um, so yeah, I particularly found this super interesting to, to reflect on that and seeing the differences despite, you know, the, the similarities of what we're all trying to achieve. So thank you, everybody. And guys, thank you so much for organizing this really, really important webinar. And thanks everybody for, for listening. Great, so I think that will be it. We'll end the recording here. And uh, for people in the um, audience, feel free to leave last remarks and then we will kick you out. <laughs> okay, take care everyone.